It was a bumpy road, but today Democrats dodged the latest threat to President Joe Biden's high priority infrastructure agenda, one that came from inside the party. The House advanced a $3.5 trillion budget resolution in a procedural vote today with a promise to vote on the bipartisan hard infrastructure bill by September the 27th, part of a deal to appease quote unquote centrist Democrats. A group of them led by New Jersey's Josh Gottheimer had been locked in a standoff with Speaker Nancy Pelosi since last night when the vote was supposed to happen. 10 members threatened not to vote for the budget resolution unless Pelosi put the hard infrastructure bill, the bipartisan one, up for a vote immediately, something they've been calling for for weeks. That's what they want. The speaker repeatedly said she would not bring up the infrastructure package before the bigger budget bill and lost her gamble that the centrists would back down. They negotiated well into the night yesterday. Politico reports that some uh, choice words were exchanged at last night's House Democratic Caucus meeting. At one point, House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer warned of mutually assured destruction if the party did not band together. Talks resumed this morning and Pelosi gave a concession to cool the centrist rebellion, if we can call it that, setting that September deadline for the bipartisan infrastructure vote. All 10 in the Gottheimer group backed off their threat and then voted today to advance the budget resolution. Now, this might all seem like petty internal political squabbling, especially over a vote that simply gets the process started. But there is a lot at stake for the real people in America who stand to benefit. As House Budget Committee Chair John Yarmouth said on CNBC today, it's what the American people want. These are support for American families and education and so forth and climate change policy. These are enormously popular, not just with the, our, our caucus overall, but with the American people. So while we may have a slight difference on how much we should spend on which type of initiative uh, overall, we have almost unanimous support <clears throat> in the caucus for that. Here's a look at what's in that budget reconciliation package. More than $700 billion for things like universal pre-K, childcare, free community college, over $300 billion for affordable housing, $1 billion for healthcare expansion, including paid family leave. There's also a huge investment in clean energy, climate research, a civilian climate corps, among other climate initiatives. Nearly half a trillion's worth, and over $120 billion for both immigration initiatives and social programs for Native Americans. It's a lot of money, but the president has called it a once-in-a-generation investment. It could change millions of American lives. So it's interesting that it's the Democratic centrists, for want of a better word, who, like the president, consider themselves quote-unquote moderates, there's another term, who threatened this vote. It wasn't the left. It was the center of the party, apparently. But they've got donors they're answering to, I guess. According to The Intercept, some of Gottheimer's largest contributors this year work in private equity, investment banking, and corporate law, all of which stand to gain from the infrastructure bill's public-private partnerships, but could lose profits to the new tax hikes in the budget reconciliation bill. Full disclosure, those donors include Comcast, our parent company. But at the end of the day, this is supposed to be politics, especially Democratic Party politics, so we're told, is supposed to be about improving Americans' lives. And it's sad to see some in the Democratic Party use this whole process as a way to score points in their own political game. So, let's talk more about this. Joining me now is Pennsylvania Congresswoman Susan Wilde. Uh, Congresswoman, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. According to the Washington Post's Thank Greg you, Sargent, man. you were one of those Democrats. You were one of those Democrats who agreed with Gottheimer in the group of 10 at the beginning, but you told him in an interview, the strategy has become stupid and it's time to fold. What changed for you on this whole process, this whole standoff? Well, let me first say, in, originally I really did feel that we should bring the bipartisan infrastructure deal to a vote right away. It's not all that often in this town that we get bipartisan consensus and I really had a very strong desire to be a vote on that. But it was pretty clear early on that, that we did not have the vote in the House to pass that deal. So what I did was I took the long range view. I looked at what I want to, um, what I want to accomplish for people in my district and in this country. And I realized that so much of what we need to get done is in the up forthcoming um, package that you just described, although it's important to say that bill has by no means been crafted. And I 
am not willing to let yeah. the perfect be the enemy of the good. We've got to get things done. And so once it became clear that we did not have the vote on that bipartisan infrastructure deal, I moved on. Fair enough. One of the arguments that we often hear in this whole process uh, is that Democrats, like yourself, are in competitive districts, and therefore there is a benefit to flexing bipartisan muscles, as you say, getting stuff done, not making uh, you know, the uh, perfect enemy of the good. But as political organizer Max Berger pointed out on Twitter today, about half of these 10 are in solidly blue seats. They're not, a, they're not under risk. They're not a threat. So I wonder, what was driving all of this? Was it uh, a sense of electioneering, this idea that I might lose my seat if I don't do this? Is it ideology, this idea that, well, actually, we don't like big budget bills, we don't like all this spending? What, what was driving all of it? Well, we can speculate about all kinds of reasons, and I can't get into their head. I think it's worth pointing out that the, um, the Democrats who are in the most competitive districts in the country all were not on on the uh, the letter from Mr. Gottheimer and yes. signed by others. So, you know, it, it, I don't think this boils down to an issue of uh, electioneering or anything else. I think it comes down to a matter of recognizing what is best for your district and for the country as a whole. So I'm not going to question the motives of those members. I know that others have questioned it. You mentioned it earlier on your show. Um, what I care about is making sure that we are flexible enough um, that we can get things done. That's what we are here for, is to get things done. Yes. The other thing is, I just want to say this, um, Mehdi, uh, you know, labels yes. are a real problem in this town. Labels are a real problem in politics generally. You know, to call the, the that group of 10 moderate, I think, is not fair to the moderate. Um, and we too often get obsessed with these labels that people have and, um, and and get caught up in it. So to, to consider, um, you know, there is a broad coalition of members across the caucus from the Congressional Progressive Caucus to the New Dems, which is a much more moderate group, um, to the Blue Dogs who are supporting Medicare expansion. So, you know, don't get too caught up in the yes. labels is what I'm saying. No, I... I'm so glad you made that point. And I'm actually, once this interview is done, I'm going to be sharing my own personal views on how labels and some of these labels, including moderate, really bother me. But I've got to say, I appreciate you not wanting to speculate on people's motives. But I do wonder how much of this is about ego. Uh, I need... I want our viewers, and you can also listen to this ad from the group No Labels that was backing the Gottheimer group. Have a listen. We live in a land made of ideals. From people who fought and suffered. We call them Americans. Fate of human dignity in our hands. Something that's bigger than yourself. How many guys do you think it takes? Rural and unserved communities. Get up, try again. It's up to you. This is the America that freed slaves. We must not become a nation of mental mutants. You will work hard to achieve it. Understanding where you want to go. Sir, I will not yield. We are all Americans. I'm not sure comparing yourself to Abraham Lincoln and Mr. Smith goes to Washington is maybe the wisest move uh, as you try and hold up your party's agenda. But let me ask you a serious question here. Was it odd to you to see Justice Democrats, for example, putting out ads defending Joe Biden and criticizing these 10? You have progressives. You have Bernie Sanders going around the country now promoting the Biden agenda. We're in this weird upside down world where the left of the party is pushing the Biden agenda and saying, don't undermine President Biden and self-styled moderates, again, for want of a better term, actually almost blowing the whole thing up. Very odd. Well, you know, what, what's not unusual to me is seeing that a whole lot of Democrats, regardless of what label you associate with them, are trying to get things done for the American people. That is what this party is all about. It's what I came to Congress for. It's what most of my colleagues came to Congress for. And so I think that's why you're seeing a rally of progress, you know, if you want to use labels, progressives, moderates, centrists, and other to try to get this done. That's why I felt so strongly that it was important to be flexible. And even though I couldn't get a vote right out of the box on the bipartisan infrastructure deal, when I realized, look, taking the long view, that I could work on something that would reduce prescription drug prices for people in my district and across this country, 
by allowing Medicare no negotiation. Yes. Well, that sold it to me, you know, and that probably that kind of issue is what sold it to a no, whole lot of my colleagues. That's that's a fair point. Before you go, very quickly, I want to ask about Afghanistan. You're on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, you led a letter uh, to President Biden urging him to take stronger action to improve the situation at the Kabul airport and evacuate Americans and our Afghan allies, including possibly extending the August 31st deadline. Briefly, um, the president says he has no plans to do that. What's your reaction to that? Well, my hope is that the president and the administration have a plan to get everybody out that they need to get out by August 31st, if that's the case. I, I think the ideal is that we're out by August 31st, but we need to get all the Americans out who want to get out. And just as importantly, we need to get those Afghan allies out. But we are in a very dangerous situation. We received a confidential briefing today that made it very clear that the threats are imminent. So I understand the president's desire to be out by August 31st, but at the same time, we have to remember our obligation to the people that we need to get out safely. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.